Hello and good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to this second webinar in the series Parliamentarians at COP26, organized by Globe International. My name is Marla Neem Hera, and I'm the Executive Director of Globe International Secretariat. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this fantastic seminar today on climate finance. We are joined by four very distinguished panelists, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome all of them, Lorena, Sandra, Professor Okereke, and Iskander. Before we get started, just a couple of words on uh, where we are in terms of this issue, Unpacking Climate Finance and COP26 is of course the title of today's webinar. And we've had some major announcements in recent days, in particular, the major announcement yesterday on the climate finance delivery plan by Canada and by Germany. Of course, climate finance is a very broad subject. And those of you who remember the Paris Agreement know that it features in Article 2, an Article 2, 1 point C. And let me just read aloud the scope of climate finance, which is making finance flows consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilience. So this is a very big landscape. We are, however, going to be discussing the um, very important announcement yesterday, which responds to the COP president Alok Sharma's call for a response to this totemic issue within the negotiations. So without further ado, I'd like to call on our first speaker, who is Lorena Gonzalez, who is a senior associate at our partners, the World Resources Institute. But Lorena has an extremely distinguished track record. She used to be the lead negotiator for the Mexican government in the Paris negotiations on climate finance and has been working on this issue for many years, including in the government, in civil society, and presently with WRI. And Lorena, you're going to give us a masterful introduction, setting the scene for this big wide issue. Over to you, thank you so much. Malini, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be joining this panel today. I will try my best to start unpacking the climate finance agenda for COP26. But as you have mentioned already, um, it is a very broad agenda. So I will just try to focus on a couple of um, key elements that I'm sure my fellow panelists will further elaborate in their presentations. So first of all, let me start by saying um, COP26 is a pivotal moment for the world to rebuild confidence that a global collective concerted action can actually sort out these great challenges that we're facing. It will also be essential to renew the solidarity. Um, and this begins with rebuilding trust between countries. For these two objectives, climate finance will play a critical role. COPs characterized as being the most successful in this process have managed to achieve concrete and meaningful progress on support for developing countries. We're also advancing, of course, the two other elements uh, of the long-term vision of the Paris Agreement, which are adaptation and mitigation. Let's recall that climate finance, after all, goes to the heart of the differentiated responsibilities of developed and developing countries under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and under the Paris Agreement. COP26 will be no different in this respect but I have to say it will be significantly more complex than previous COPs. Very briefly, I would like to refer to three key framing elements. And we can take, of course, any questions in the Q&A session at the end. Um, the first one is the lack of trust between developed and developing countries that is currently in the landscape. The second element, uh, the impact of the uneven recovery from COVID-19, which is a framing uh, parameter that is very different this time around from previous COPs. And the third one, um, the challenge of the formal finance agenda that uh, Glasgow will have to address. So first of all, countries are arriving in Glasgow with very little trust on progress to deliver on the 100 billion goal. You already referred to the delivery plan this is a long-standing commitment under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And it has also become a token of trust and solidarity between developed and developing countries. So it goes far beyond the material implications of, of this um, delivery of financial resources. It also touches upon the symbolic uh, relevance that this goal has had under the UNFCCC. So the delivery plan uh, published yesterday by Canada and uh, Germany, commissioned by the incoming COP26 president, unfortunately fell short from expectations. 
Um, it was supposed to address two key questions in terms of how developed countries are going to fulfill this commitment under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And on the other hand, when is this target going to be met? And the details, unfortunately, point towards uh, 2023 as being the first year when this commitment could be reached. Um, so this provides very little reassurances to developing countries. As such, um, what we are facing in the final days ahead of COP26 is the need for new pledges on climate finance and much more work in terms of articulating a collective strategy that actually becomes a credible um, contribution to the process and that will enhance this uh, space for the negotiations as Glasgow begins. The second point that I would like to raise uh, for this insighting presentation has to do with how this lack of trust comes hand in hand with the uneven recovery from COVID-19. The pandemic has further exacerbated the needs of developing countries while creating additional pressure um, to advance competing development priorities. These, these are facts and, and we need to acknowledge them getting into, into Glasgow. So after two years of the COVID-19 crisis, a deeply divisive period, we have to say it, the stakes could not be higher. The COVID-19 pandemic impacts have been uneven around the world and so has been the recovery. Let me just refer to one concrete example. With mounting extreme weather impacts through 2020 and 2021, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to expose all of these inequalities. For example, with estimated 114 million jobs lost and about 120 million people pushed back into extreme poverty, the UN has warned already that the pandemic could lead to a lost decade for development. This is an important thing to bear in mind while getting into the climate negotiations. Also, emerging trends for the initial uh, rescue and recovery packages announced last year um, are unfortunately showing systemic inertia in the way in which uh, countries are spending. And this goes both ways, for public uh, budgets and expenditures, and also for the private investments that these packages are stimulating. Concretely, the 50 largest economies in the world in 2020 announced the spending for over $14.6 trillion. This figure has grown this year to up to $16 trillion um, in 2021. And though there are different methodological approaches to try to estimate the green portion or the green component of this spending, uh, most of them land in, in more or less the same numbers. Um, signaling that it's only about a fifth of the total announced uh, spending that will be characterized or could be characterized as this green spending contributing to climate objectives. So this is a very small portion of, of what we have seen um, in terms of announcement and recent spending since last year. In a recent WRI paper, uh, our analysis also found that most of the G20 countries have missed opportunities to address issues related to adaptation and resilience as part of this recovery spending and these stimulus packages. This approach, of course, is counter to the long-term objective of the Paris Agreement to make all finance flows consistent with a low carbon and a climate resilient development, as you have already referred to in your introduction. We need to also address the fact that in this, in this context of the pandemic, um, while developed countries have announced these unprecedented volumes of spending, many developing countries are experiencing reduced fiscal space and growing concerns in terms of debt sustainability. This is closely interlinked with the quantity of climate finance that it's available to them but also to the quality of this, of this finance provided. And here there are three key elements to bear in mind because these are top priorities of developing countries going into Glasgow. Um, the first one has to do with the percentage of adaptation finance from the total envelope of climate finance. The second one has to do with um, the higher use of loans instead of grants in recent years for developing countries. And the third one, are the persistent challenges in terms of access 
to climate finance that developing countries continue to encounter. So these, these are sort of um, the key elements uh, that um, everyone attending COP and following the finance negotiations um, should be focusing on. Third, uh, and this is the, the final element I would like to flag for this um, scene setting introduction, the COP will address, uh, Glasgow will address the largest finance agenda in the history of the intergovernmental process. This is not a minor thing, and it's important to factor in while well, considering uh, the potential scenarios for the second week of the negotiations and for the outcome in Glasgow. So this finance agenda will be twice as large as in previous COPs. And this poses all sorts of challenges in terms of sequencing, time allocation, the time for spin-offs or informal consultations uh, with um, parties and with the ministers. So this uh, finance agenda also bears an additional layer of complication, which is it will address a mix of traditional finance issues, some new agenda items under the conference of the parties serving the Paris Agreement, and it will also handle some of these pending matters in relation to the Paris rulebook. So just to flag a few, the CMA will start the consideration of the post-2025 climate finance goal. This is the target that will succeed the current 100 billion goal that runs through 2025. The COP and the CMA will also address elements on ex ante climate finance. This has been one of those key elements under the long-term climate finance agenda item under the COP. And it's one of the new elements under the CMA uh, as mandated by Article 9, Paragraph 5. Um, this is a key issue because in these agenda items, the core element is how to enhance the predictability of climate finance for developing countries. And this is essential when we're tackling the 100 billion question as well, because it seems like we keep finding out very late that the delivery of these resources is not happening either at the scale or the pace that is needed. So these are essential elements um, that will be in the hands of the negotiators. Uh, finally, these, these matters related to the Paris rulebook that are still pending um, have to do, for example, with Article 6, where a share of proceeds could be used for adaptation and of course, also the finalization of the reporting guidelines under the enhanced transparency framework. So this is a very, very broad agenda. On top of all of these, of course, there are these reviews that are not done on an annual basis and will concur all during Glasgow. So this is a review of the financial mechanism, the review of the functions of the Standing Committee on Finance that I'm sure we're going to hear all about by Sandra. And um, finally, the review of the adaptation fund as well. So these are processes that are not considered by a COP on an annual basis, and all of these are going to be considered during Glasgow. So as you can see, um, there will be plenty uh, to go around. Uh, one final point I would like to flag, um, it's not necessarily considered a finance agenda item, but it's going to be crucial to bear in mind while getting into Glasgow, and this has to do with loss and damage and the financial options to actually address losses and damages already happening in developing countries. All of these priorities speak to the need to ensure an equitable approach and a just transition in the end. Um, that's what would measure um, the success of the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So just to conclude uh, these initial remarks, we cannot act on climate without shifting finance, that's for sure. And that's one of the, of the key elements in terms of trying to address in advance what a successful Glasgow package would look like. I'll stop for the time being uh, here. Thank you, Malini, for the opportunity and looking forward to the exchange. And thank you so much, Lorena. Um, this is, uh, I feel quite daunted, actually, just listening to you. It's very clear that finance is going to be at the heart of the negotiations. It's really going to be the elephant in the room. Um, and we're just at the foothills. So anybody who thought that with the announcement yesterday, the deal is done is very much mistaken. You've laid out the complexity of the set of decisions that have to be made in the next few weeks, but also the rhythm of the next few years as this cascades through the Paris Agreement, the Glasgow Accord, and then, of course, looking ahead next year to the African COP. 
So, and not to forget, we have a big event taking place this weekend, which is the G20. And so that will set us up again for some enhanced uh, delivery, hopefully. So um, let me turn to our second speaker, please, who is Sandra Guzman Luna. And Sandra is manager at the Climate Policy Institute, but also begin, be, brings a varied background in government, civil society, um, and has been the founder of the Climate Finance Group for Latin America and the Caribbean, GFLAC. Um, and formerly was the climate change director in the environment ministry in Mexico. Um, and uh, Sandra, you've also done some amazing work mobilizing women's organizations and young people around the green finance and the climate finance agenda. So very much look forward to hearing from you and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malini. It's a real pleasure to be here also uh, with Lorena Iskander and, and Professor Okereke. Um, I would like to start uh, highlighting probably why after so many years, uh, climate finance uh, remains like a central topic in the international negotiations. And, and I would say that this is because climate finance is the materialization of the commitments. No, we, we have been talking about uh, reducing emissions, we have been talking about reducing vulnerability, but at the end of the day is how, how we are going to get there, how we are going to do that, and, and the level of, of, of transformation that we have to, to achieve in order to do that. Um, today, what I would like to do is highlight some of the messages that uh, Lorena perfectly uh, put in the table. And, and I would like to highlight these, uh, not only at the international level, what is really important at the international level, but as well, how all of these elements are very important for developing countries uh, in order to accelerate climate action. Um, and I'm going to highlight some, some key messages that in collaboration with many actors, and, and, and uh, we have been trying to, to, to highlight and to, to put out there and to start, a, I think the, the, the very first point is how we are going to, stir, to start transforming not only the narrative, but the practice of climate finance. I think uh, after the IPCC report and the conventions uh, report about the levels of ambition that we have in the NDCs, uh, we have to recognize that we are in a very difficult moment. We are living an emergency, and this requires a, a really good collaboration, a better uh, co cooperation among nations. And as you were mentioning, we have a better uh, solidarity approach. Uh, I think we have to start uh, transforming this narrative related to climate finance that used to be very, uh, yeah, in, in, in this donor and recipient approach. And, and we have to start also thinking in how we are going to increase collaboration and cooperation among uh, uh, entities. And of course, as Lorena was saying, this is a, a, a really difficult moment because uh, we need to keep building trust. And this is one of the, the key issues that we really, we, we need to keep uh, looking for these uh, uh, actions to, to keep building trust. But I think one of the key elements that around the world uh, we, are, we are observing is that common finance is not only about a number. Common finance is about a co the consolidation of an architecture that will help us to deal with all of these issues at the different levels, not only internationally, but also nationally and at the local level. And it's how can we get an agenda that is fair? And this is where we have been thinking that the, the climate finance has to, be, it has to be framed in a climate justice a, a scenario. A, how can we mobilize enough resources to support those a, that are more vulnerable? but how we are going to really use uh, climate finance to transform. At the end of the day, it's not only trans transferring flows around countries or across countries, but it's how we are going to use this climate finance to really transform at the national level to accelerate these actions. Um, of course, uh, you have been mentioning the, the, the role of the 100 billion that we know it's a political commitment that has been in preparation for the last 12 years. And as Lorena said, the announcement that we hear yesterday, of course, eh, it's good to have a plan, but unfortunately, the plan is not necessarily um, dealing or tackling the key issue of, of, the, of what climate finance eh, is, because we know that 100 billion is not enough to, to tackle uh, the, the climate emergency. It is important to comply with 100 billion because it's all about building trust uh, in the system, building trust in the regime, building trust 
and trust in, in, in the actual negotiation framework. And we know that it is important to have a plan, but we still, we all know that is not enough and we have to accelerate uh, those, uh, those yeah, uh, financial uh, transfers to ensure that we are not only talking about the 100 billions, but we are talking about like 100 billions as a very first step uh, because it shouldn't be the, the, the last goal at all. Uh, and in that sense, it is important to keep, uh, as, as, as Lorena was saying, uh, building a little bit more or, or providing a little bit more detail in how these 100 billions will be delivered. Uh, the plan says that by 2023 20, should be uh, completed, but still uh, we don't necessarily know how, how it's going to be delivered and through which mechanisms and all this and it's really critical. Uh, and for sure, this part of the balance is an amazing, a very, very critical issue. In CPI, we re uh, released the global landscape a few days ago, and we still uh, see that uh, between 2019 and 2020, 90% of the climate finance flows went to mitigation actions. And the Paris Agreement has been telling us uh, that we have to balance adaptation and mitigation finance, and we haven't been there. Uh, we, we, we are not getting to that point, and this is very critical. And I think COP26 has to send a very strong message about uh, how we are going to increase adaptation finance. And this is connected to the, to the next point regarding the predictability. Uh, and this is precisely one of the key issues. As you know, we are discussing this uh, Article 6 and the uh, carbon uh, market mechanisms. Uh, and a lot of countries have been saying that carbon me me market mechanisms should uh, support the adaptation actions because of the history between the Kyoto Protocol and the, and the adaptation fund. And it is important that the carbon mechanisms can provide certain points, but we cannot rely on carbon mechanisms like to, to keep feeding adaptation uh, actions. And this is a critical point. We have to keep strengthening the adaptation fund uh, that I didn't see it in the plan yesterday. Uh, so it's very, very important to see how we are going to keep strengthening the institutions uh, that are already there and that are doing a good job. And adaptation fund is going to be critical. And I hope this COP will bring it to the table as well. Yeah, Lorena was mentioning this key issue about loss and damage, and, and I think this has been there for, for a while. It's a point that wasn't uh, agreed in, 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 in Madrid, and we have to really start uh, defining how we're going to tackle this. We cannot just uh, leave it uh, away. Uh, we have to start uh, designing what is going to be the mechanisms to the mechanism to really tackle the, this problem that is re already out there and, and countries are already bringing numbers about how much are they losing because of climate change. Um, uh, but I would like to emphasize a couple of things and uh, just to, to, to really think developing countries are struggling a lot because uh, of the access of climate finance. And this is not only at the national level, but I think one of the key agendas, uh, as Lorena was saying, is how we are going to ensure this access, not only at the national level, but particularly at the local level. We know that cities, we know that local communities, we know that a lot of non-governmental organizations are doing an extraordinary work at the national level, but they are not accessing to climate finance. And this, is, has, this has to be a critical issue because what we are observing is that the multilateral uh, uh, financial mechanisms, the MDBs, and all these type of institutions uh, that, are, that we have in place are not uh, ready or are not uh, uh, generating the adaptation processes to really tackle climate change at the local level. And we have to start designing or defining how the financial institutions that are in place will be able to, to, to flexibilize and to adapt to this, to this changing uh, climate as well. And not only um, in, uh, in providing better ways to, to generate uh, access to, for instance, emergency windows or all sort of uh, mechanisms that can really reach to those that are uh, in need. Because we know now that most of the finance, uh, climate finance stays at the central level, uh, at the governmental level, and is not coming down. And this is a, and, and while we are discussing about how we are going to strengthen the institution uh, or the institutions at the international level, we also have to start having a deep uh, conversation about how we are going to decarbonize our public finance systems. Um, as Lorena was saying, the pandemic is showing us that a lot of developing countries, also developed countries, but a lot of developing countries are still relying a lot on fossil fuels and extractive activities to generate revenue. 
this means that for them it's extremely difficult to just, uh, you know, like continue economically because they rely on these resources. So one of the key elements is how climate finance will support developing countries in creating this transformation, creating new industries, creating new jobs to generate new revenues, because this problem, this reliance on these fossil fuel and extractive activities will remain a big issue and we are not going to be able to achieve Article 21C if we cannot decouple the public finance scenario from the extractive and fossil fuel activities. And this has to be a really big issue in the coming, in the coming years. Uh, just to give you an example, in Latin America, the carbon intensive activities are 196 times more or higher than sustainable investment. So this is a big issue. Uh, and of course, we have the problem of debt. Uh, we know that a lot of the, 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 the finance that countries are receiving are in forms of loans, and this has created a lot of debts at, a, at the national level. And we have to start uh, dealing with this. How can this step can be relieved to start investing, investing in the protection of biodiversity, in tackling climate change? And this has to be a major element uh, in the coming months. And finally, I would like to emphasize these points about the new climate finance goal. We know that 100 billion is not enough, but we also know that we don't have enough information about how much climate change costs, you know, how much the mitigation and adaptation uh, um, me measures will cost. And we know that in order to have a better approach, we need to, to base that new goal in terms of what are the needs at the developing countries. But many countries haven't been able to, class uh, to quantify those needs. And this has to be a major, major element that needs to happen in the coming one year or two, how developed countries can support developing countries in the estimation of those costs to bring to the table those numbers and then generate a really good approach about what are the needs, no? because otherwise we are going to end it up with a political commitment such as the 100 billions and at the end of the day, we are not gonna solve the problem. So I, I will stop there, sorry if I, if I extended, but I just wanted to, to, to raise those, uh, these elements that at the local level are going to be critical because we are already observing these major gaps in terms of the financial um, access and distribution. And, and if we don't tackle the whole package, as Lorena was saying, we will be failing definitely in, in this COP. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Sandra. And again, very clear articulation of the key elements in play. Um, in particular, grateful for you flagging the issue of subnational, the decentralization of climate finance. Very important because we know of the major role that cities, local governments, and subnational institutions are playing and also need to be financed for their strategies to implement their own plans. Uh, the second key issue there is also of uh, decarbonizing public finances. And I look to you, Professor Okereke, also for illuminating this in terms of the challenges facing uh, countries which are heavily invested in, in extractives. Uh, but let's move now to the third speaker. I'm delighted to welcome Iskander Ersini Venoir, who is a policy advisor with E3G. And Iskander has been focusing on the broad issue of sustainable finance and will pull back slightly and speak about the broader landscape and also this 100 billion plan that we've been hearing so much about. So Iskander, over to you. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you, Malini, for, for having me, and uh, thanks to my um, excellent uh, co-panelists um, who've gone uh, before me. Um, so I'm going to try sharing my uh, screen uh, right now. I have a presentation as well, and hopefully it will all, um, it will all come up. Give me a minute. So that should be visible. Uh, any moment now, if you could confirm. Looks great. And I'll try full screen. Is that is that showing on full screen? Perfect. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, my presentation unfortunately won't be as colourful as 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 Sandra's uh, very visually appealing one, but um, I think it will be highly complementary in terms of um, uh, building on on some of the different uh, issues raised and, and covering some other issues. Uh, that uh, Lorena also flagged to begin with um, in her initial remarks. Um, so to begin with, I thought uh, it, it would be worth just acknowledging uh, a couple of the reasons why finance is so significant 
to to COP26. Um, and I've, I've put down uh, here three uh, key factors for, for discussion. Uh, one being developments in the in the world and in, in the financial sector since uh, COP25 uh, took place in, in Madrid. Um, the second being uh, the particular color that the UK presidency uh, has put on the finance uh, topic um, and, and its sort of role uh, in the presidency. And um, the third, I want to talk about this, the, um, the top line, uh, you know, what's COP26 for and the role that finance uh, plays in that context. And I think we'll see a number of the different issues that my colleagues surfaced uh, uh, raised in, in, in the context of, of those three different issues. Um, so firstly, just to sort of provide a survey of, of um, uh, some of the developments in, in finance since uh, COP25, I think obviously key among those has to be the once in a century uh, event that has been the COVID-19 pandemic. And here I'll, I'll take the liberty of, of um, reiterating and reinforcing uh, some of what my, my colleague uh, Lorena uh, has already uh, pointed out. Um, I think it's uh, no surprise um, that I think there's a fair amount of uh, convergence between us and, and in uh, civil society more broadly um, about the, um, the reason why uh, COVID-19 um, in terms of the broader economic and financial uh, policy context uh, will make uh, COP26 a, a very special COP. Um, one part of it, which uh, Lorena did mention, is the uh, really important uh, economic choices uh, that governments and, and by extension legislatures, as we're seeing in the US, uh, face around uh, recovery spending uh, packages. Um, and, you know, with the infrastructure lifetime uh, of some of the investments uh, being considered, particularly in the energy space, uh, we know that decisions today will, will, will shape the, the sort of climate uh, story for decades to come. Uh, the other half of the uh, of the story, which Lorena also mentioned, is um, the inequalities in, in the global re recovery. We are seeing an uneven and bifurcated uh, recovery globally. Uh, and that is, uh, in many respects, uh, a story of finance, a story of um, differences in, in, in fiscal space uh, between, between countries that are able to um, you know, take care of um, of, 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 uh, of their populations that might be laid off work or uh, to, to uh, put together massive stimulus packages and those that, that haven't been. And an important uh, factor in that is obviously the, the cost of capital as well with the um, unequal access to international capital markets. Um, this, this diagram here from the IMF, I think reflects uh, both of those points. It reflects both the enormity as, as uh, has been alluded to of the uh, the, the spending uh, that is happening uh, in the in the tens of trillions in 2020 alone, uh, but um, you know it also demonstrates the unevenness of that and how much of that is is situated in the advanced economies and how little of that is is happening um, in uh, emerging markets and, and low income uh, and developing economies. Um, yeah, so. Another uh, area, I think, which is worth flagging in the sort of broader finance context uh, are these changing uh, norms that we're seeing in the finance space over the last uh, two years since 2019. And I think what we saw in 2019, <clears throat> excuse me, what we saw in 2019 was the, um, <clears throat> was the beginnings, uh, the seeds, if you will, of um, uh, of what we what we're now seeing sort of bloom uh, uh, today, if you will. So you know, if we look at some of the headlines from from 2019, that uh, I know some of us uh, in in civil society will will remember, um, those are very much instrumental in in setting up the diplomatic agenda uh, that's that's being um, put forward for for COP26 uh, on uh, phasing out uh, international uh, fossil finance. Um, but also more broadly with, with a lot of the stuff going on in the uh, private finance space um, where, you know, you had obviously initially commitments by uh, countries, but then commitments by firms 
sort of sectoral agreements uh, within subsectors of finance. Uh, and now what you see is um, uh, a real, uh, essentially a, a normalizing across the entire financial sector uh, of this idea of, um, of net zero. Uh, obviously there's been a lot of uh, criticism of greenwashing in that space, uh, but it, it nevertheless represents a, a step change in the um, in, in attitudes. And I think what is very interesting and particularly perhaps for a, an audience of legislators is, is the pivot now to policy and regulation on, on, on net zero finance, um, which, which can obviously help to um, uh, ameliorate the, the greenwashing issue uh, and to enable uh, action, um, provision of standards and, and, and so on and so forth and disclosure requirements. Um, I think in terms of uh, talking about finance at uh, COP26, I think I'd like to maybe start by situating it in the broader context of um, the um, efforts to uh, really draw a line in the sand, um, you know, in line with the science um, and ensure that um, the actions taken at, at Glasgow are, are commensurate with the, you know, the, the warnings that we have from the IPCC about halving emissions in a decade and so on. And so obviously we've seen a lot of, um, a lot of talk from uh, the COP presidency as well as uh, vulnerable countries around keeping 1.5 uh, alive. And I think as my colleagues uh, suggested, the uh, 100 billion uh, delivery plan that was uh, suggested, that was, sorry, that was released yesterday um, you know, it's, it's not enough. Uh, and as I think you said yourself, Malini, um, you know, anyone that thinks that that will be uh, a sufficient uh, financial offer, so to speak, to uh, keep 1.5 uh, alive uh, will be um, mistaken. Um, I think it, 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 does some, it does the bare minimum in establishing the foundation uh, for trust uh, that past financial commitments uh, are going to be uh, delivered in some way, uh, shape or form, even if not on the timescales originally intended, as this graph suggests. Um, but what that is uh, really important for is enabling uh, further commitments to be made with some semblance of uh, credibility. And here, um, I think I'm going to echo some of the, the points that were made um, by uh, my colleague um, Sandra, uh, but uh, maybe zoom in on 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 some in particular um, that uh, uh, that that perhaps uh, could could be fleshed out a bit. So I think all of these are um, are key elements uh, as we've identified um, uh, as as previous speakers have identified to to, to sort of building agreement um, across. Uh, you know, developed and developing countries, major emitters and vulnerable countries. Um, and I think that, you know, you won't be able to land a package on accelerated ambition in terms of mitigation uh, without a package uh, on accelerated finance um, that will have, you know, several different parts to it. Um, and, you know, these include uh, obviously mobilizing the trillions necessary, uh, but also uh, scaling adaptation finance, uh, as, as, as Sandra mentioned, which, uh, you know, I think in the reactions to the delivery plan, uh, we've seen uh, that be emphasized quite, quite explicitly. Uh, easing access to finance is something that has been talked about uh, throughout this, this year. And I know uh, colleagues and, and others have worked on, on, on this agenda uh, through some of the, um, the discussions um, that the COP presidency has, uh, has supported. Loss and damage as well. Um, I think will be one to perhaps discuss in the sort of ensuing uh, uh, chat. And then, um, of course, as, as Lorena mentioned, the, the post-2025 climate finance goal, I think um, particularly the, you know, the elements that Sandra mentioned of making sure that it's needs-based, uh, I think would be a, a sort of key, um, uh, a key um, point of consideration for developing countries uh, that are weighing um, you know, uh, the, the idea of committing to accelerated ambition, right? Um, so maybe just in closing, uh, some final thoughts on mobilizing uh, the trillions. 
because of course unless the trillions are mobilized we we, we won't keep 1.5 alive we won't deliver uh, 1.5 um you know i think what we need to see at cop 26 is turning this rhetoric into action uh, and we need to see commitments at the leaders level because we know that uh, the environment ministers that were responsible for putting together de the delivery plan uh, on their own won't be able to mobilize the trillions this is something that requires uh, leaders level ambition and also um you know finance ministries and, and so on um and so i think we'll be looking to uh, countries and in particularly the the G7 with its uh, B3W for quantified goals on investments in developing countries around clean energy and infrastructure, uh, as well as a, uh, a diplomatic agenda for for delivering that in in 2022 uh, across uh, the G7. Also, uh, hopefully bringing in in China in the in the G20 um, with some of its moves around greening the BRI. Um, and, and this entails obviously a, a reform and recapitalization of uh, international financial institutions, MDBs, uh, and other development finance institutions. Um, we need to see uh, better approaches for getting the finance system to work better together across public and private finance, both regional uh, and, and global, and it needs to be responsive to, to country needs. Uh, and, and sort of regional and, and thematic uh, opportunities. And we're gonna see some movement on this uh, launch next week at, at COP, but, but more, much more is needed and, and all the architecture needs to be resourced. Um, we're also seeing um, finance for, for countries uh, in, in terms of the energy transition beyond coal, obviously from a mitigation standpoint, that's absolutely key for keeping 1.5 alive this decade. Um, but I think uh, one, uh, important uh, consideration to, to bear in mind is obviously the, the international uh, uh, concerning debt uh, situation that, that we're seeing in the developing world um, and the looming possibility of a debt crisis. I think we need to get a whole lot better at um, some of the uh, debt swap mechanisms um, that uh, Sandra mentioned, but also a much broader uh, set of reforms, um, including uh, everything from um, debt service suspension, uh, extension that's fit for purpose, um, uh, better approaches to debt sustainability analysis as, as the IMF uh, and others are, are responsible for, uh, in a way that doesn't actually penalize uh, developing countries for, for making the investments that they require in order to build uh, resilient and, um, and clean economies of the future. Uh, so I think that's that's it for me. and. Uh, Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Iskander. You've painted a very detailed picture, but one I think which reveals the extent of fragility within the international system right now. Just going back to Lorena's caution at the beginning that we could be facing a decade of lost development. Um, and so I think the stakes really couldn't be higher. Um, we have some questions which are coming in thick and fast, but we also have our final speaker. And I'd like to call upon Professor Chukumurije Okereke from the Alex Ekweme Federal University in Nigeria, where he is the Professor of Global Climate and Environmental Governance and Director of the Center for Climate Change and Development, and is um, an expert on the broad issue of now national green growth and energy transition and has played a key role in the climate change bill that has recently passed both houses of the Nigerian parliament and which I hope will receive presidential assent before COP. Uh, Professor Okereke, over to you, please, for your remarks, and then we will open up the Q&A of this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malini, for inviting me. Um, I think a lot of the presentations are very, very complimentary. And I will just be adding my voice to uh, the excellent presentations that have been made, perhaps focusing more specifically on the African context. I think um, by way of framing, it is important to realize that the climate finance which developing countries are uh, demanding from the rich countries is not a, a gift. It's not a gift. It's not also charity. It stems from the foundation of climate justice. Um, and there are three key elements of justice that uh, are important in the climate context that relates to finance. 
And these three key elements of justice lies in what I call three asymmetries. The one is a symmetry in contribution, which is clearly uh, saying that uh, countries have not contributed to climate change uh, equally. Um, and that some parts of the world, uh, the rich countries have enjoyed untrammeled pollution for a period of decades, if not close to a century, and have profited uh, uh, disproportionately from this pollution, uh, climate polluting activities. Whereas poor countries have contributed very, very minimally. And uh, the second asymmetry lies in asymmetry uh, in impact, which is that climate change impacts are not felt uh, equally by all uh, communities and countries around the world. And particularly that the poor countries are the ones that, are, that have contributed the least are the ones that are uh, bearing the greatest impact. And of course, we have a symmetry in voice which speaks to the fact that not all people, all nations have equal representation in the uh, decision-making tables where climate policies are decided, including COP. And this issue of lack of voice have a very major implications uh, to uh, climate finance as I will be uh, uh, you know, explaining in my presentation. You know, only recently, because of the unprecedented flaws in Western countries, including Spain, Germany, and United States of America, uh, rich countries are now beginning to awake to the devastating impact of climate change and the need for emergency measures to deal with climate change, including loss and damage, which I think uh, Lorena has uh, um, identified. However, uh, Africa, and indeed small island states and many other poor countries around the world have long been living with the crippling uh, impact of climate change. And this has been exacerbated by the issue of COVID, which uh, some of the other uh, speakers have touched upon. Indeed, the African climate change context has passed dangerously epic proportion. And in Nigeria, for example, has witnessed intense and unprecedented scale of flooding in the past five years. The International uh, Federation of Red Cross and uh, uh, Society reports that in September 2020 alone, uh, torrential rainfall, river flooding, flash flooding affected nearly 200,000 people in uh, Nigeria. Uh, and this led to nearly 25,000 uh, uh, people being displaced. Now, an estimated of about uh, 53 million people in Nigeria may well be relocated at a global uh, sea level rise of 0.5. Um, and, and cities like you know, Abidjan, Cape Town, Dar es Salaam, Lagos uh, may well uh, be completely submerged. And with this will go uh, trillions of dollars worth of infrastructure. Uh, climate change is also causing deep distress in food security systems in Africa. Of all the five staple uh, crops in Africa, many of them will suffer nearly 30% uh, loss in productivity according to popular uh, climatic models by 2030 and 2050. And this will exacerbate the issue of uh, food insecurity. Um, according to recent uh, preliminary estimates, the economic impact of climate change in Africa uh, may well be in the tune of 200 billion per, per year. And it may well be more than that. For a long time, rich countries have treated the 100 billion as a high mark target, the fulfillment of which will absorb them of all form of climate justice responsibility. The reality, however, is that the 100 billion pledge by rich countries, uh, which they took upon themselves in 2015, is actually a tiny drop compared to what climate change is costing and will cost uh, developing countries. Uh, I'm drawn to one report actually by the UK uh, DFID for uh, that's the Department for International Development, uh, which is now part of the FCDO, which actually finds that for Nigeria alone, uh, climate change may well be already costing 100 billion uh, per annum and maybe up to 460 billion by 2050. And another recent uh, report by the UNFCCC Standing Committee on Finance suggests that between, I think, 5.8 to 5.9 trillion would be needed to fund less than 50% of the NDC commitments of four countries by 2030. 
So this begins to paint a clear picture of the gross inadequacy of the 100 billion. Uh, take another statistics, the World Bank calculates that the cost of cyclone Ida, which devastated uh, Malawi, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe uh, in 2009, is at, uh, at a cost of about $2 uh, billion. Uh, and these sorts of extreme weather events are now uh, projected to be uh, likely more frequent by the IPCC, which have, talked, uh, which have been described uh, in terms of code red uh, for humanity. Now, we've been talking about this 100 billion, uh, but actually, um, if you take some really critical studies, especially by the one from, published by, by Oxfam, you get the sense that the total uh, available climate finance is not more than 22 billion, actually. And this is roughly 60 to 65 billion less of what uh, the OECD is suggesting. And Oxfam arrives at the figure by removing all the loan repayments, removing all the interest, um, removing private finance, and then taking a much more conservative uh, approach in how you define what is climate finance. Uh, we see that even the most generous and liberal uh, definitions, which uh, you know, puts uh, uh, the flow currently around 79 billion, um, is still very far from what is needed. But actually, I think that one of the thing, key things that should be discussed in COP26 should be what actually accounts as climate finance. And so I'm hoping that poor countries will press for uh, maybe some kind of IPCC work uh, that will talk in details about the, uh, some kind of transparency of measures in what should account for climate finance. Um, because a lot of uh, opacity and lack of transparency uh, is what characterizes the current landscape. And then the issue of additionality. Uh, in the first major text of the United Nations Convention on Climate Change that was signed many years ago, it was clearly agreed that climate finance, uh, which rich countries will provide to Africa and other poor nations, uh, have to be new and additional to existing ODA commitments. And the reason for this decision was that climate change impact and adaptation measures pose incremental costs uh, to existing burden of development. So as such, the UN Convention makes climate action in developing countries conditional to the adequacy and predictability uh, in the flow of funds from rich to poor countries. However, despite the clarity of the rules that I have referred to, uh, rich countries have been cleverly uh, repackaging their ODAs as climate finance. And there are several instances, you know, we are funding that we have ordinarily gone to support Traditional energy, transportation, education, agricultural development have been rebranded as climate finance. So there is a distinctive possibility that if you actually remove all of these kind of trickery, um, as I sometimes call it, you may find that the total envelope of climate finance remains far less uh, than uh, even uh, the most conservative estimate uh, that we, uh, the most generous estimate uh, that we now have. So current accounting and reporting measures uh, needs to be a critical part of conversation uh, in COP26. Now, uh, we often talk about climate impact, mostly in terms of the physical impact. But uh, as you, Malini, were uh, uh, you make, make a mention in, in uh, part of your intervention, this is also about the transition risks. Countries like Nigeria, for example, that are resource rich and have for a long time dependent on oil, you have to somehow make an adjustment and transition to low carbon future. If you calculate the cost of transition, you will find out that the climate finance again pales, the current volume pales in, in significance compared to what is needed. The calculation done by my center and drawing from a wide range of resources show that in Nigeria alone, the transition risk will cost uh, the country over 200 billion per annum. 100 billion only uh, going um, to loss of jobs uh, and, and livelihood. About 13.9 billion in stranded assets 
12.8 billion in oil and gas debt, and about 4 billion in the replacement of critical infrastructure. You see, energy, um, Africa is energy impoverished. The total installed electricity capacity in Africa the, as a whole is around 147 gigawatts, equivalent to what China installs in one or two years. The whole of Nigeria has installed capacity uh, less than uh, London Heathrow Airport. So Africa needs to be increasing its capacity by a minimum of 6% per year to stand a chance of meeting the universal access goal by 2050. Unless this gap is closed, Africa will remain a dark continent, not metaphorically, but practically. So the question that arises is whether these new promises of climate finance, and of course, if you uh, dissect it along the lines I have done, whether they are able to help fund African uh, energy security, especially when they are most likely to come from uh, with tough conditionalities, including the defunding of coal, gas, and oil uh, investment. And it's instructive that while many rich countries are pledging to stop uh, investing in gas in Africa, many still retain gas as part of their long-term energy portfolio. Uh, and, and this kind of smacks of what we call uh, carbon colonialism. So, and we often fail to really focus on the fact that the constrained carbon space which we have is as a result of historical uh, emissions that have profited mostly uh, rich countries. It is also telling that China's pledge to end coal production does not cover you know, domestic uh, coal uh, in China, which kind of is more than double what uh, all other countries are, are, are using at the moment. So unless there is a radical change, uh, over 40% of African population will still cook with dirty fuel and charcoal and, more, and, and uh, you know, animal dung by 2050. So there has to be an emphasis in making financial flow consistent with the path towards a GHG emission, but also climate resilient development along the lines that Lorena read uh, from the text of the Paria Agreement, that the commitment was to make financial flow consistent with low carbon development. And that is not happening at the moment. And someone, I think Isaka has touched on the issue of debt. The fact that, for example, 94% of all the uh, climate financing to India comes from Japan and Germany, and that overwhelming majority of that is from loan, um, uh, smacks of uh, injustice because this kind of arrangement can further exacerbate the debt burden that Africa and many other poor countries have. So a landscape of loosely defined, fragmented, unpredictable and opaque climate finance will not foster the kind of trust and solidarity that Lorena uh, and other uh, speakers have, have spoken about. It will rather exacerbate the condition of uh, distraught and impose new risks in, Af in, uh, in Africa. I have recently published an op-ed which I have, where I made a case that yes, I am absolutely in favor of a net zero uh, carbon target. However, net zero carbon target has to go with net zero hunger and net zero uh, poverty targets. This is the way to tackle climate uh, together with the other major sustainable development goals that are germane for the resilience and development of Africa and other poor countries around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Okereke. And we have just a few minutes literally to go before closing this session. And you've raised so many more questions that we have time to answer, but very important contributions. I think highlighting again, the inconsistency which plagues the um, commitments which have been made and the need to ensure accountability uh, from governments. Um, I would like to start with some of the questions which we have in the Q&A. Um, please, panelists, I encourage you to respond to the questions directly in the chat, those of them that you're able to. But let's start with Barry Gardner's question. And that has to do with a theme which has come up again and again, the attention to loss and damage for success at COP26. And Barry Gardner MP asks, Absolutely agree with the necessity to address financing for loss and damage, but what mechanisms would you suggest? Should there be a separate fund? What criteria should be there to receive and how to distribute the fund? So who would like to take that 
question on first. Lorena, perhaps we should start with you. Thank you, Malini. Um, this is a complex question, and, and unfortunately, we don't have much time to um, deep dive into the details. But I would say one thing that COP26 can do is actually enhance the consideration of this matter in a very concrete way. There are several parallel tracks um, running. One is, of course, the Santiago network and the operationalization of how that will work. The other element that I believe it, it's much more complicated to keep tabs on are the different mandates that are already in place for the Standing Committee on Finance, for the Green Climate Fund, to create synergies with the Warsaw International Mechanism and the XCOM. So these are bits and pieces of work that have not been that visible during 2020 and 2021. COP26 will take stock of this, and part of what they can actually deliver is what comes next. And what comes next should actually address directly these financial options. So what is it concretely that these different entities can do? Of course, having a separate fund could bear some benefits in terms of we have heard over and over again in this panel um, how complex the architecture is and how complex the access matters are. Uh, however, to set new funds takes time as well. So that's the flip side. Um, on the positive side, so to speak, like having dedicated funds would be a, a thing that many developing countries would argue would be useful. On the flip side of it, um, putting together this type of architecture, launching a new fund will take time, will require a new architecture, and these would need to be complementary to what's already in place. Um, so lots of things to watch on loss and damage, I would say. Um, in particular, this synergy creation, I think, will be essential. Sandra referred to this in her presentation. The full architecture has all of these opportunities for enhanced synergies to avoid duplication and to enhance uh, the complementarity of efforts. Thanks very much, Lorena. And we have other questions to do with the non-traditional climate finance donors like China. How will their contribution, their role play out at COP26? And Iskander, I might come to you for that. If we can just take a few minutes more on this session, and you may also want to address the issue of the breakdown of the plan that we've seen just yesterday in terms of the balance between public and finance contributions. So over to you, and Sandra, I'll be coming to you next. Thank you. I mean, I'll just uh, be brief. I'll take your latter question first with respect to the breakdown um, that was outlined in the delivery plan yesterday. Um, it uh, is noteworthy, perhaps, for uh relative to the um roadmap uh, that developed countries put forward in marrakesh um in 2016 it uh has much more conservative assumptions about the mobilization of private finance because one of the things that the developed countries were criticized for um was for being overly optimistic uh, about um the, the leverage ratios and the degree to which uh, private finance uh, could be brought in to support the 100 billion. Um, and so this time around, uh, they've, I think, listened to the criticisms and uh, had very um, conservative assumptions in there, which um, uh, basically assume um, sort of a base case uh, scenario to be um, something um, equivalent to the, the worst case of, um, you know, what was achieved before. Um, so I think that that is, uh, and you can see that it, it doesn't change that much in the um, in the graph that I demonstrated earlier. With respect to China, I think, um, as noted, I think uh, it's uh, front and center on uh, a lot of people's uh, minds as an emerging economy, uh, and indeed a country uh, which is expected to ascend to a high income status uh, within um, the next few years, potentially. Um, there are a lot of questions about, about China entering the, the, the donor uh, pool. And so some of these decisions that we're seeing right now um, around you know, greening the BRI, potentially scaling up uh, clean energy investments as well, uh, are very much uh, to be understood within uh, the, um, the, the, the sort of confines of, of that, um, that prospect. Um, and the discussions around uh, the post-2025 uh, uh, goal, obviously the, the parameters uh, for that uh, are yet to uh, 
you know, have been set, and that's partly what Glasgow is purposed to do. Um, but um, I would imagine that um, uh, the existing uh, Annex two countries will be very uh, uh, emphatic about um, ensuring that um, uh, newly industrialized countries are, uh, are uh, paying their share. Thanks very much. And Sandra, if I can come to you about the question about the needs report, if you can just explain what that is and your thoughts on it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just a, a, a very quick comment. Let's not forget that this is a process. Every single COP is progressing in all these items. Uh, this needs report is the very first needs report that has been done. It was very complex in terms of the availability of data. You will see it. It will be published in COP26. But I think the the in my point of view and having been part of the of the process of the elaboration, I just could say that it's also a call for all countries to provide better information about what are these needs. It's not like to to blame anyone, but it's more like a call. Like how can we create processes internally in developing countries to better determine what is what is needed? Not only not only at the governmental level, but also at the local level, at non-governmental level. So what is needed? and then bring those uh, elements to the conversation internationally, because at the end of the day, the best approach to create a new financial goal would be the, that approach that will come from a bottom-up approach, because it's a way that uh, the, the obviously will we'll bring to the political scenario, but it will be the way that we can ensure that not only finance flows are, are going to go around, but also it's the only way that we can ensure effectiveness, tackling those uh, elements that were already identified by developing countries. So I think I encourage you to keep a, a, an eye on the report and also uh, to use this as a base towards the new conversation about the new goal. Thank you very much. And we've come up to our time and actually beyond our time. So Professor, I'm going to come to you last for your thoughts, your top tips really focused on legislators who are our primary audience for this webinar. Um, your final concluding remarks, and then I would like to wrap up this session with a thanks to all of you and to our participants. Legislators have a fundamental role to play um, in climate finance, whether it's monitoring, tracking, evaluation, but critically from developing countries, also ensuring that we can mobilize a vast amount of money in domestically from these countries uh, to help to fund the transition. But currently, uh, Air Force has green budgeting in most uh, poor countries is very, very limited. And so this is one area where uh, legislators can play quite an important role. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. Unfortunately, Lorena has had to drop off and it just shows it's a very, very busy time for everybody who's working on this issue. I think a key highlight for me, which kind of sums up stuff is if we're looking to accelerate ambition, at COP26, we have to accelerate the finance for that ambition. So on that note, thank you to everybody who's joined us today. If you have missed some or part of today's webinar, don't worry, you can catch it again. You'll find it on the globelegislators.org website. And please join us for the next one, which is going to be from COP itself next Tuesday, the 2nd of November. But for now, thank you very much to our wonderful panelists and have a lovely day and see you next time. Thank you so much.